Genesis chapter 2. We will look at two verses that are keen, but then I'll be mentioning something in chapter 2 and chapter 3 as we continue to expound our thoughts in this regard. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and morning the second day. And then the Bible continues to give us the narrative. The third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. Then if you go fast forward into verse 26, then the Bible now tells us, Then God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The doctrines of the Bible, we call them doctrines because we see it spread out all scripture. That is why we need to be bold and strong in doctrine. Your relationship with God is directly related to your understanding of the doctrines of Scripture. I think I've said it here before, that where the Bible has no mouth, we should have no ears. And therefore, when you listen to many other funny doctrines are said there, be keen to go back to Scripture and ask yourself, what does it say? We have people today who would bring out man as, as, as powerful, almost as God and X, Y, Z. But we must have... Um, biblical understanding of who we are if you're going to have even a biblical understanding of what salvation is all about. And so the doctrine of man seeks to help us to understand why God, in, what, what was God's intention in creating man and, 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 and what is man's purpose in the world. And the issue of identity, who am I, why am I here, why I was created, it's, it's found right there in our understanding of the doctrine of man. Why did God create us? And, and the Bible is not silent about who God created us back in the day in the pristine era in the Garden of Eden. The Bible is vocal about it. It tells us man was created perfect. But the Bible also tells us the post sin era and talks about the fallenness of man in sin in the after the garden of eden talk about everything that happens towards uh, after that uh, sin of adam and eve but ultimately the bible also talks to us about the post christ era what is gonna be for man after all is said and done so the bible tells us who we were in the beginning tells us what happened in the middle tells us how we are supposed to end our lives and the question of identity finds its answer in our understanding of man's beginnings from God and man's end to God. We've come from him and we must go back to him. And if we fail to see it in this way, we will mess up. We will mess up our perceptions and ultimately our reception of the gospel. That I understand the gospel of Jesus Christ as I understand it as, as well as I understand why God created me and what happened to us when we were born from a mother's womb. But also, I respond to the gospel as neatly as I understand why I need it. If I do not see myself for who the Bible really says I am minus Jesus Christ, I will not find any need to respond to the message of the gospel. And so it is critical for us to understand why man was created. And so our main point for today, in case you start dozing and just the cold gets the best of you, God created men and women. This is our main point. God created men and women for their mutual fellowship and for his glory. That man would relate with each other in a way that is glorifying to him. That is why God created us. 
And we need to appreciate this truth as well. That a high view of God brings a healthy view of man. A high view of God. If I look at God as high as he says he is, it will give me a healthy understanding of man in two ways. In my sin, as fallen, wicked, deserving of wrath, and in Christ, as forgiven, washed, and cleansed. A high view of God brings these two realities into perspective. And so three things that I want us to focus on today as just seek to understand why do we believe the things that we believe. And number one, we see in the Bible the humanity created, humanity created. And this one goes to answer the question, why did God create us? Why did God create us? Why on earth for heaven's sake am I here for? Why am I here? And many people find themselves stumbled up in ideas concerning the creation of man. You know, the science and evolution, they will, they, they, they will try to come and say, okay, this happened, this happened. But at the end of that conversation, there is, it doesn't still avail anything much for the soul. It is not concrete because there are still many questions to be answered with that kind of thought. The other thing that comes in our day is the whole conversation of superheroes. And we have men who are so powerful and beyond any, any, any harm or injury, the invincible man. And you know, that's a, it's a sham, it's a lie. Because there is nothing like a superhero man. Man is fallen. And the thing that that one does, it makes our hearts dull of the reality. Because somehow, some way, I think that I'll ever come to a place where I will be beyond destruction or rotting or death. And it's a malady, it's a problem in our, in, in our, in our generation. And we need to understand then that God did not create us for these things. So the question is, why did he create us? Did he just create me to be, to be this person that, you know, Lorna Maguire, a man of stone, or, you know, um, Iron Man, or, or um, this person never dies, you know, um, um, Aquaman, um, Ant-Man. But even, there's even Ant-Man. <laughs> What's wrong with us, man? Anyways, why did God create us? Several things. Number one, Isaiah 43, verse 7, the Bible says, everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Number one thing that we need to understand when it comes to humanity created is that God created us for his glory. For his glory. That is why God created us. He created us for his glory. And the glory of God is basically the splendor and the brilliant beauty that shines through all of the divine attributes of God. God's grace, God's mercy, God's patience, God's uh, endurance, God's long-suffering, kind of all these things are enshrined in this thing called love. That is who he is. It is all in the aspect of his glory. God is glorious, and that is why he's able to do all these things that he does. And he created us so that he can be seen as glorious for his glory, so that he can look at what he created and still see, yes, it expresses the fullness of my character of my person. And that one is especially evident in the person of Jesus Christ, that God is most glorified in Jesus Christ because he is the exact imprint of his image. If you read Hebrews 1, uh, if you read Colossians, he is the, in, the, the, the God incarnate. And so all of God's glory is seen in all of Christ. Therefore, God is glorified in all who have Christ. God receives glory in that way. And so God created us so that we can, he can be glorified. He created man so that in a small way, in a small way, he could be seen as brilliant and as full of splendor and as full of majesty in the creature that bears his image. It is amazing to see a lion. It is amazing to see a cheetah. It is awesome to see a snake or, or a cobra just building up its neck and all those things. It's an amazing view. It is most amazing to look at a man and realize right there is a stark image of God. It is much more amazing to look at ourselves in the middle and realize this is what makes God glad. Why? Because God is glorified in that. God is glorified in his creation. He is glorified in plants. He is glorified in maize. How you just grind it and it becomes flour and you make it as ugali. Amazing, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's just flour. <laughs> flour. Unga. And so it's, it's, it's amazing, but it is much more amazing to see yourself in the mirror and realize that is the very work of God. God created us so that God can be seen as glorious as he is. But secondly, God created us 
for the fulfillment of our purpose, and that is to glorify him. Two things. He created us for his glory so that he can receive it all and just say, yes, this is fine. But secondly, God created us so that we can glorify him. He creates us, number one, so that he himself can, can see, yes, I am glorious, I am all that there is. But he also creates us so that we, when we see him for who he is, we can reflect back the glory to him. And I gave an example, I was saying, for instance, if I look at Deacon, and God looks at him, and God looks at Deacon there, and, and, and he sees Ken, and he's like, yes, I am glorified in these uh, five foot something inches, uh, slender guy, surplus like me. Anyway, so he's, he's glorified, he looks at him and says, yes, this is a good representation of me. But then, when he re relays that to Deacon, Deacon now responds, looks back to God and says, I praise your name, I I'm glad that you made me this way. In that way, he is reflecting back glory to God. God is glorified when he looks at what he has created, and then what he has created glorifies him by submitting to the way that God has created them, in obedience, in love, in worship. God created us to glorify him. That is the purpose of man. Why are you created? We are created to glorify God. The Bible says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, Psalm 27 verse 4, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, all the, all the days of my life, doing what? Gazing upon the beauty of the Lord. That is the glory of God. His desire is to be there where God is, so he can just simply see, this is God. Wow! Amazing! I, I like what I see. It's it's out, it's out, out of everything that I've ever seen. And God creates us so that we could reflect that. The psalmist does that. That is why we are created. Man and woman was created in order that he or she may show forth the splendor and brilliance of the beauty of God that is in Jesus Christ. He makes much of himself. God makes much of himself by creating us. So that we can make much of him by living for him. God shows how, how much godness there is in him by creating us in his own image. So that we can show just how much we respond to that godness by living for him. That if I'm not living for God, I'm not glorifying God. And so the question is then, why am I here? Why? The catechism question if you are if, if you are well read in the things of faith, the catechism question number one usually is, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? Why was man created? Answer. The chief end of man is to glorify God, Father, Son, and Spirit, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Why are you here? Why were you created? Oh, and above all things that you will do in this life, you are created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we do that in many ways. We have many things to do in life. We need to grow up, right? We need to grow up. We need to go to school. Then after school, we need to finish and do more school. And then after more school, try and do more school as we work on our careers and maybe then find ourselves in, in, in marriage or singlehood and children or none and then get a house, get a pet, live and then die. Like that. That's all that your life is all about, right? Let's just go. Let's travel around here. Yeah, let's own motorbikes and bicycles and all. And then let's die and let people cry for us. And hallelujah, we are dead. No, that is honestly, if our purpose is to just live so that we can die, we are missing out the point. But listen, we are not like goat and sheep that they are born to be eaten. I mean, at the end of the day, they either die of sickness or die of celebration. One of those two things will happen for to these do I, no, no dogs. Uh, the <laughs> cow and sheep and goat and there was news yesterday, by the way, you saw that yeah, the hunger is so much that guys actually ate dogs. Talk to the Chinese about this later. Uh, that is all they live for. They, they I mean, they, we fatten them so that we can eat them. Fat. If you live your life like that, you just live so that you die. It's, it's, it's base, it's low, it's, it's, you're lowering yourself beyond what God has designed things to be. So there are many things that we can do in this life. However, the ultimate purpose in all these things is one, to glorify God. In education, glorify God. In, 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 in whatever things that you're doing in your career, glorify God. And that one is expressed in many ways. But also we see that God is 
created man in his image, in his image and his likeness. Genesis 1, 26, 27. God not only created a man for the, for, the, for the sole purpose of glorifying him, but God created man in his own image and likeness. He created us, male and female. Unlike other creatures, we are the only ones who bear the image of God, giving us value beyond all other things. That is why God created us. He, he, he created us in his image so that we can be more valuable than other things that he has created. And God is very deliberate in creating man like that. Why? So that we can have a purpose and we can have a destiny. We can live for something bigger and better. Principle number one. Man was created for God's glory. That is why we are here. That's the doctrine of, the, of, 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 of man in the Bible. We were created for God's glory, not for anything else, not for no one else. And after life is said and done, whether or not we glorify God is the biggest question we need to answer. Are you glorifying God? But secondly, we see humanity compromised. So yes, God created man. He is created in, and, and why is he therefore to glorify God? But we see humanity compromised. And the question is, what happened to us? What on earth, for heaven's sake, went wrong? In Genesis 3, we see the fall of Adam and Eve, the fall of man. They are given instruction. They don't abide by it. And so they are defiled uh, on account of deception from Satan. And the sin of rebellion against God, against his word, against his instructions comes in. And all the way from Genesis chapter 3, we see a fallen man. The perfect image of God that was there between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 was distorted but not lost was distorted. Man fell from where he ought to be and she ought to be, but it was not lost. That though Adam and Eve sinned, yes, there's something they lost that was God-sized. Not necessarily lost. There's something that was warped. And when that was distorted, we lost our true identity, we lost our true nature, and we started becoming everything else but what God created us to be. That is why you have the stories of, of Adam uh, sinning, and after that you have, for instance, Noah, and, and the days of Noah and the flood, because of the wickedness of man, we have Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Abraham. We have all the wicked things that the kings did. Think about the Amorites and all the other tribes. They did filthy things from temple prostitution to child sacrifice, people eating their children. All these things, think about all the rapes that happen around, all the molestation of children, everything that you see from husband battering to wife battering and every other form of thing, all that comes because of the distortion of the image of God on account of sin sin. That is what happened to us. Why is it hard for us to, to just be as good as we ought to be? Because there is a distortion that happened in us. And for those of us who are without Jesus Christ, you know that this is the biggest problem. Your problem is not be, be a good boy, be a good girl. That won't work. That won't work at all. We need something much more than being good and being nice. We need something deeper than that. And that is the salvation that Jesus Christ gives. And so what happened to us was that we, we, we were distorted all have sinned, all fallen short of the glory of God, but not all was lost in that man. That is why today, if you're here and you're not born again, if you respond to the message of the gospel, then it is possible that Christ can save you. Forget about all these narratives of guys who say, oh, now you know, I'm, 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 I'm living life now so that I can, I can be in the highest form I can ever be. And so they say that you live your life so well so that when you die, you can come back in a different form, right? Yeah. I wonder how many people you've eaten who have come back in form as gods, right? So you eat, you go to the gym, so you go to the gym, you lift all those weights, you're so strong, so that when you die, you come back as those Texas bulls that, uh, you know, those bulls, or you come back very strong and mighty and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are lies. Those are narratives. The highest form of life anyone of us can exhibit is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. When he comes into your life and transforms you, we need to be a new creation. But that is not the end of the story. Otherwise, the gospel will not be good news. There is the redemption of man. And that is where the image is recovered in Christ progressively. The image that was lost and distorted is now recovered in Christ progressively. And the Bible will tell us in Colossians 3.10 that we have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. That is what is happening now. That anyone who comes to Christ in salvation, for faith in salvation, that they will be redeemed. They will be born again. They will be washed. 
the compromise that happened can be dealt with because of what Christ has already given as a perfect sacrifice. That which was distorted, that which had, had lost meaning and value, finds its meaning and value in the finished work of the cross of Christ. He bought us with his blood, as we're going to celebrate in a few minutes, and he brought us back to the place where we ought to be in the image of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, the Bible would say. He has done it for us. Therefore, though man fell from sin, though the image of God in us was distorted, and I'm just going to share with you how that is expressed in, in, in our lives, it is restored in Jesus Christ. Man is not absolutely left to his or her own vices. No, no, no. There is serious damage that happened, yes, but there is serious, serious salvation that can happen when you turn to God in Jesus Christ. For those ones who have faith, redemption is available in Christ. For those ones who do not have faith in Christ, redemption is available in Jesus Christ. But we also see we not only fell redeemed but there's also completion that one day for those of us who are born again one of the things about the doctrine of man that should encourage us to carry ourselves properly in this world is that one day god is going to completely move us from this world and restore us to a place where we will not have pain not have temptation for sin not die not cry not feel all those things why because the completion is going to happen the image will be completely restored first corinthians 15 49 the bible would say just as we have borne the image of the man of dust in this life with all the pains and temptations and pressures we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And so ultimately, man, by virtue of a relationship with Jesus Christ, can be eternally restored at the return of our Savior. And we will be as we were meant to be in the Garden of Eden, where we will never need any adjustments or improvements, only transformation. Principle number two, that outside of Christ, God's image in man is distorted. That is what happened. Outside of Christ, God's image in man is distorted. That is what sin does. It distorts the image of God in us by making us see ourselves much less than we ought to see ourselves. Sin caused us to live below the mark that God had set for us, the standard that God has set for us. Perfect in nature, perfect in relationship with the Father. And when you look around us and see how lowly we carry ourselves, when we indulge ourselves in drugs, you are going there and, and you're there with, with, with all these things. You're drinking yourself silly. You're smoking your lungs to destruction. You engage in all these things. You live a low-level kind of life in this way. You are messing up the thing that God gave you and calls it his temple. The reason why we engage in these things is because we have a messed up view of who we are. There is nothing fun and exciting for you sleeping in the ditch and just drunk like nothing else. You are distorted. Something wrong is happening inside of you and when you see it for what it really is, then you return to Christ for faith. When you see all the immorality going on, the worst thing about pornography is that it makes men and women become as tools and instruments devaluing them from the very image that God has put in them. Every man or woman who participates in pornography and you watch them, you are agreeing with them that what God made is useless. Is nothing. And so when you watch it and enjoy it, you, you are buying into the lie that that person is just an empty shell. There is no woman in the pornographic industry or man who is an empty shell. Why? Because there is an image of God distorted there. And when rightly expressed, those same people can come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is where those things are off. Because they are the very image of God. When we allow boys and girls to handle us in ways that, that are unnecessary, boys handling you girls like you're their wives and don't even have a relationship, or girls handling you boys like, like they're your husbands and all the morality and filth in fornication and, and adultery, it's, it's, it's an expression of the distortion of the image of God in man. So we find ourselves giving ourselves over and over and over and over to these people and to those kinds of experiences. 
exciting pleasures that are temporary. Why? Because we have no clue who we are in God. Every time we do that, we say this to God. What you did is nothing. That is the problem. That is the problem. Because outside of Christ, outside of Christ, God's image in us is distorted. That is what the enemy wants to do. That is what he longs for. And so any, any of these things makes us realize that we have reduced ourselves to nothing because we are compromised. But Christ makes the difference. All is not lost because Jesus Christ makes the difference. The feelings of insecurity that we experience and acceptance of guilt and shame, they are all an effect of our, the distorted image of God in us on account of sin. And when we come to Christ for faith and salvation, that image is rectified. We are brought back to where we ought to be. The solution for man in this fallen age is not good manners and much more good manners. It is Christ. Christ. When Christ conquers our hearts, we are able to see ourselves for who we really are. Therefore, handle ourselves for what we really are. But finally, in the next three, four minutes as we prepare for the Lord's table, humanity as equal. And so we see humanity created in the image of God and all those things, imperfection, blah, blah, blah. But humanity fell, compromised. But we also see God creates man, male and female. That's the reality of the doctrine of man. That God created man, male and female. Equal. No one was deemed better than the other. Other, other than God. God is the only one who is better than any of us. None of us is better than the other. Male or a female. The physical makeup of a man is mostly different of that of a woman and therefore fit to carry out some things better than a woman, not making man better than a woman, but simply because there is a way that God has created man that makes him able to do some things better than a woman. The same way there are things about a woman that God has put that makes her do some things better than man. None of these differences makes any of the sexes better than the other. God has created us equal. We differ in roles, yes, and responsibilities, but we are really equal. There is no man or woman that is greater than the other. Forget about this, all these badness of, oh, what a man can do, a woman can do what matters. There is a feminism conversation that is devoid of the message of the gospel, and many girls in our generation, if they will ever respond to the true gospel in the Bible, must fight their minds today for them to receive what Christ has said in the Bible. There is a level of rotten masculinity that every man must fight in their heart to death if they are going to live the way God has designed for them to live. God deliberately created us, male and female, for a reason. For a reason. And that's basically how God, God designed things. And the danger in society is that we have taken these differences as a means of control and, and trying to prove. I don't see the point to prove. Why should you prove that you're a woman? Why should you prove that you're a man? There's no point in doing that. Why? Because God created us in these differences so that we can have joy in him. We can foster the joy in him. But, 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 but because of the distorted image, if you remember, male and female is now an issue of conversation. It is a problem. It's a, it's a problem. Oh, boy, child, girl, child, child, child. It's, it's an issue. But it is never really an issue. If we find ourselves humbled on account of the gospel that God gives, we will not have any extreme, as they want to call it, extreme femininity or extreme masculinity. Because the glory of God in Jesus Christ humbles us to realize that everybody is somebody and God is all. God created us like that, knowingly. How could you At eh, good, I'm not talking about him, I'm talking about him, eh, Allah, oh, Nidem. Ah, I'm not Adam, Adam, Ivy. Oh, Adam, Lala, come at Adam. Hey! No, 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 no. 
he knew what he was doing when he was doing it. Why did he do that in that way? One, for personal relationships. For there to be relationship and beauty. If all the world was full of men, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. If all the world was full of women, you know there would always be traffic, right? Anyway, so the beauty <laughs> cannot be overlooked. <laughs> we can't overlook. God knew why he was doing what he was doing for personal relationships. But secondly, for mutual submission, mutual. The other thing is that men and women are different, yes, in some ways, but this difference, is, this difference is not a matter of control or superiority. No. The reason we do not have joyful submission between the sexes, male and female, is because of the fallen nature we received from Adam, the distorted image. There's a problem. There's a same problem in our hearts. And that is what makes us not have joyful, mutual submission. We no longer long to see things the way God made them to be seen. And until we come back to what God designed, we will have trouble, we must have trouble, we must have trouble until the root of the issue is sorted out. And that is, how did God intend us to exist? as male and female. All that God created was good. That is his confession. It was good. And he was okay with it. And after the fall, this goodness was altered. This goodness was messed up. But not totally done away with. And that is why Jesus Christ is there. That all the goodness that God put in man, because of the death that took place in the heart of man, these two sexes find themselves in commotion, in conflict, in a quagmire of sorts, in a war that will never end until these two sexes come to the person of uh, Jesus Christ. You will not take advantage of a girl sexually or emotionally or in any way when the gospel continues to transform your heart and vice versa. The master's heart is the heart we need to long for. When we understand that there's a way he created us, there's a problem that happened, but there's a solution that he gave, then we progressively start walking in the journey of sanctification. Point number three, as we just about ready up the Lord's table, that male and female are equal in essence, but different in roles. We are really equal, just different in roles. There's none of us that is better than the other. No, 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 no. So some conversations are neither here nor there. They're neither here nor there. I know when you come from families that a few things are messed up, we might be able to think in either extreme. I am a man. I am a woman. You know, yeah. Listen up. After you've beaten your chest and it's paining and you've gone to hospital to take some pain pills, <laughs> come back to this truth. That when you submit to the gospel, the gospel has a way of transforming your heart and training you to see things how God sees them. Period. And until we come to that place, welcome to WWE. <laughs> you will fight until you see the gospel's work in your life. So are you living for God's glory? That's a question for you. Have you acknowledged that you have a distorted understanding of who you are? In what ways have you found it difficult to uphold the beauty of God in creating you as male and female? What are the issues that are going on in your heart? Well, you need to turn to Christ today for salvation and faith. If you hear the you're not born again. You're, 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 you're a big ball of mess. Until you come to Jesus Christ, that mess is not going anywhere. Jesus Christ is the only one that has power. The gospel has power to transform our thinking and our very lives. And today, if you turn to Christ for faith and salvation, you will really see yourself for who he made you to be. If you are a sinner, you will see yourself for who you really are, dead in your sin and trespasses, worthy of the wrath and the destruction that comes from God, except for Jesus Christ. If you are born again, you will see yourself for who you really are, transformed a new creation in Christ, not under the power of sin and the flesh, and all those things can be conquered because of Jesus Christ. So whether born again or not born again, our remedy is still Jesus Christ. And we only find ourselves as consequent, as, as, as consistent to what God has made as we are in our relationship with Jesus Christ. You forget everything else I've said, please remember this, that God created men and women for their mutual fellowship and for his glory. Lord, I pray that you're going to help us now as we're just about to get the Lord's table going on. That, Father, you will cause us to be mindful of these truths. Something wrong happened, but something right happened as well. And so I pray that we will focus on the right thing that happened. That is, Christ died for us to transform us and to make us who he really wants us to be. And that when we come to Jesus Christ, our lives can be changed. 
Bring us to that place. If there's anyone here not, today who is not born again, God, I pray that their hearts will see the glory of the gospel so then they are able to exist, male or female, in a manner that glorifies you. That is our prayer in Jesus' name.